Hi, I'm Greg. And I'm Leanne. Welcome, Welcome to, to the Empowered, Empowered Poly Podcast. Podcast, where we give you the tools to help you feel more empowered in your polyamorous and consensually non-monogamous relationships by sharing what we've learned as relationship coaches and as individuals. Empowered Poly is LGBTQ2IA+, alternative lifestyle, and kink-friendly. Thank you for joining us. And enjoy, enjoy the, the show. show. Hello and welcome to episode 31. Uh, today, we're going to talk about Ambi Amory. Uh, before we get started, though, I want to kind of do a little special promo thing, yeah? Yay! Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so for those for those of you watching the the, the YouTube version of this, I, uh, or so, sorry, for those of you not watching and actually listening, I'm now holding up a prized possession, which is the new book by Jessica Fern called Polywise. Um, mm -hmm. We will have her and her co-author david cooley on an episode of our podcast coming in september i don't remember the exact date of when we're recording it but i know that it'll be out sometime mid-september i believe mid to late september so keep an eye and an ear out for that and uh, we're super super excited for that and i am i just we just got the book in the mail the other day um i am like 22 pages in and i am just hooked like it's just incredible mm. Even just 22 pages in, so much to learn and process and listen and and glean from from the the beautiful mind of Jessica Fern and her co-author David Cooley. So great book, highly recommend. It's called Polywise, and we'll have Jessica Fern on the podcast in September. All right. So today we're going to do something a little bit different. Usually, you and I kind of go back and forth and we have a conversation. Today we're going to do a little bit of an interview. So you're kind of like my special guest. <laughs> okay i like yeah. it so yeah so i the thought was is that we would i would interview you ask you some questions give you an opportunity to explain what it is and kind of dive into it sound good sounds fun i'm stoked for yeah. this i'm i'm a little nervous because you know whenever you're kind of i don't know representing uh others that might feel the same way and use the same label you don't want to speak for their experience. So I'm going to really try and not do that and just speak to my mm -hmm. experience or in general terms, but what I know others have shared with me mm -hmm. about theirs. So, yeah, and I think that's important. I think, I think sharing your experience and, 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 and why you identify as ambi ambi amorous is, uh, is really valuable. Um, and it's important to note that you're not speaking for everyone who mm -hmm. might identify as with, with this particular term. Um, but you're speaking with your own from your own personal experiences, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. So let's jump right in. Okay. Let's start with probably the most obvious question. What is ambiamory and what does it mean for you? Okay, my understanding of ambiamory is someone who is able to be both in monogamous and polyamorous relationship dynamics. That means that they have a sense of values attached to both of those things. So in my case, uh, I would say that what that means for me is I have some values that that are in alignment with monogamy. And though I'm in a polyamorous relationship and I'm a practicing polyamorous person, I haven't always been. I've toggled back and forth throughout my life between both relationship kinds of dynamics and so um i can i can be in either a monogamous or a polyamorous relationship i value things about both of them and i also struggle with things about both of them to be honest that's that's part of my truth is that it's not you know kind of comfortable for me in any relationship dynamic. I'd be curious about the term ambi amory. Um, so it just came to mind when you were talking that that it's it's it has the same prefix ambi as ambivalent. And ambivalent means that you could take it or leave it basically. You don't really have a strong opinion about something one way or the other. Mm. Um, I think, do you think that's, that there's yeah, I think that prefix actually means both okay. as in two almost like by uh it has by yeah included in it 
right? So think of ambidextrous people. They can use their right hand, they can use oh, their left yeah, hand. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, yeah, good, good point. Okay, so that means that you could be both. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that leads me to a question that we didn't, because we did we did prep a little bit for this one, and I, I shared some of the questions I was going to be asking her. So, some Oh, yeah, very briefly, kind with... of over breakfast, like 10 minutes before <laughs> we did this. So I'm just saying, I, I have no... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. Then no you won't idea remember what I'm that say. I did. You won't remember that I didn't ask you this question because it didn't come up until just now. Perfect. Okay. So, so why not? Well, I, I guess I, I guess the question becomes: Do we really need another label? And the reason I asked the question is, is because why not just refer to yourself as polyamorous, and then when you're going through a monogamous relationship, why, why, why do you, why did you need that other label? Mm hmm. Good question. Does that make so, sense? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So labels are something that either people resonate with or they don't. Let's just put that on the table right away. Some people are label resistant. Labels feel restricting to them. They don't like them. They don't want to use them. They feel it's uh, too many things to, to, you know, maybe discuss or remember or whatever. Uh, for others, that label creates sort of a safe space and a, a way of expressing how they are in the world. So in this case, why do we need another label? Well, for me, when I'm in a monogamous relationship, if I'm able to say to that person, I'm actually ambiamorous, they have an understanding that there's part of me that values polyamory. There's part of me that uh, you know, intrinsically identifies with it. And while I might be in that moment choosing a monogamous dynamic, that's still there. It's still part of me. It's still part of my internal dialogue. And that's part of the struggle that I was talking about earlier. So <laughs> in that monogamous relationship, I might feel quite restricted. And part of my journey in that dynamic is to have the internal dialogue going on all the time about that feeling of restriction and dealing with those emotions and managing them um, and, and, and hopefully having some discipline around that, right? Some, some self-discipline about I'm making a choice here to be monogamous as an autonomous person and therefore... I'm going to choose this behavior instead of that behavior, that kind of thing. I haven't always been successful. I'll be honest. I have cheated in monogamous relationships before, and I'm not proud of that. Um, and I, I, I think part of the reason why I've moved into poly uh, sort of with you full time is because of that. And I don't, the cheating experience is harmful for everyone involved and it's damaging and difficult to navigate and uh, ethically questionable and all of those things. When I was doing those activities, I had lots of reasons why I was doing them. I was the queen of justification and I didn't know myself very well. I didn't know that I actually had this other polyamorous part of me inside. So um, it's, it's taken decades and a lot of mistakes to come to the conclusion and to recognize this term and to say, that's me, that's how I feel. Right. And that's why I think for me, the, the label became a, a safe space. It became a place where I could understand myself. Why was I always in monogamous relationships, seeking other relationships, other connections on some level, even just emotional levels? With, with people I was attracted to? Why was I continually wanting to flirt and wanting to cheat? And, you know, why was that even part of my thought process? I think it's because polyamory existed as an identity inside and I wasn't fully monogamous. I wasn't 100% in that place, right? 
And so therefore, again, when I'm in a polyamorous dynamic and I can say to my partner, hey, I'm actually ambiamorous. We can talk about what that means. We can talk about the monogamous part of me, the values that exist within and the beliefs that I still have roaming around in me, very much supporting a monogamous mindset that can impact our relationship and how I might experience polyamory, right? We've yeah. had those talks and I think they've been really helpful. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. How did you come up about the term Ambi Amory mm. or Ambi Amorous? Online. I saw it. <laughs> I saw it in a group uh, probably three years ago now. And I was just like, ding, <laughs> kind of, you know, the lights all started flashing and I was thinking about it, reflecting on it, journaling about it and thinking, oh, this is, this is a real identity. Or if you like, some people prefer, you know, relationship orientation. Mm -hmm. um, and it's confusing to be ambiamorous. I want to say that for me, it's confusing because those two mindsets are quite different. And I think maybe as a polyamorous minded person, you can, you can understand how that might be confusing if suddenly you, you know, realized how intrinsic your, there were mono beliefs still roaming in your mind, right? Like mm -hmm. that could be quite a, uh, could upset the apple cart as it were, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, yeah. so it so can be you... challenging. Right. Yeah, for sure. I can, I can, I can only imagine, I mean, as somebody whose orientation is poly, um, I, I've been in monogamous relationships and they've been not successful by, by, by the traditional societal way that the way society um, measures that success um, through longevity and faithfulness. So mm -hmm. uh, they haven't been successful in that regard but they have certainly been successful in many other ways. So I, I, you know, I can understand that it's, it's challenging to, to have both sides of those. So here's a bit of a, a, a sort of a, a provocative question for you. <laughs> Does it mean that you're only poly until somebody mono comes along and sweeps you off your feet and then you want to be mono? So is the default mono and poly is just the way you are because your partner is poly? For me, the answer is no. And I think how I know that to be true is because of my own behaviors in monogamous relationships. That desire for freedom, that desire for other connections, that desire for, you know, sexual and emotional, like, um, uh, alignment with more than one person at a time. Mm -hmm. Um, and my first marriage was polyamorous for a couple of years. And, uh, you know, that's, that was very formative and, and we made some mistakes and we didn't know what we were doing and we had no resources and ethical slut hadn't even been, been written yet. So, so our models were like, you know, seventies porn and <laughs> for a magazine, you know, lots of hair. Lots of hair. Uh, nothing wrong with hair. Um, no. And so I just, you know, recognized even then I was the instigator. I was the one who wanted to bring in other experiences for myself. Um, and even though it was my, my husband, my first husband, who actually broached the subject of opening up the, the marriage, Prior to that, I had suggested a threesome. And so, you know, there's, <laughs> that's a way of managing that desire. And I think that comes mm -hmm. up for a lot of people who are either polyamorous in a monogamous uh, relationship or they're ambiamorous. And so that's a way of sort of expressing that need or desire can be that, mm -hmm. you know, let's, let's try a threesome. Um, it's that sexual component that might turn into something emotional. Um, some people go the other way. I'm quite demi. And so, you know, my, 
my sexual experiences have primarily been with people that I already know, trust and love um, on some level, you know, um, even if it's a short period of time, but I, I do trust them. Um, I need that in order to feel safe, right? So that that applied in that case, even with the with the broached threesome. Um, <clears throat> and there I was, you know, um, relatively newly married and saying, hey, <laughs> let's 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 do this thing um with this person that i already like and know and want to get to know better that to me is you know evidence that it's an identity that i just didn't understand i just couldn't articulate i had no words right so as i'm listening to you explain all of this i'm wondering what is what is the difference between ambiamory and polyamory? Because I I listen to your experiences and I think about my own experiences and I'm like, well, yeah, I've been there. I've done something similar that, to that. I've cheated in my other relationships. I've always felt like I never fit into the monogamy box. Um, mm -hmm. And there was always this part of me over here that that wanted to explore, but didn't know, didn't have the language, didn't have the information, the knowledge or whatever. Um, didn't even know it was a thing. Right. So what's the difference between being ambiamorous and just being polyamorous? Because there's a ton of poly people in the world that are are current, I'm assuming, currently going through long term monogamous, monogamous relationships. Mm -hmm. Right. So what's the difference? I'm not sure that there's a ton of difference, except that. The monogamous values and belief systems are still very prevalent within and I have no desire or need to, to shed them. <laughs> mm. Right. Okay. So then, so then the difference becomes in the poly, in the poly mindset, we want to get rid of as much mononormative programming as we can for me to be able to open myself up to the idea of ex expanding love and, and defining relationships in whatever way works best for me. And one mm -hmm. of the ways to do that is to remove a lot of the default that happens in mononormative programming. So you're saying that with poly with ambiamory, you actually hold on to some of that? Mm -hmm. And what I do value instead, it? yeah, exactly. Uh, I meet myself where I'm at. I accept myself for who I am. I'm not, that's not always the case. <laughs> it hasn't always been the case. Um, I've beaten myself up in both dynamics, poly and in mono, for not conforming, right? right? And so this journey has led me to being able to accept both sides of myself mm. um, and to recognize that that's okay. Other people feel the same way. I can still have value systems and belief systems that I treasure and, and want in my life that are about monogamy um that are Such embedded as? in that um well i think <laughs> oh god this is this is this is gonna get this is gonna get hard to do because i i'm i feel nervous about sharing this stuff okay such as um my preference <laughs> as a polyamorous person would be to have monogamous partners. So you would want, you would want sort of a harem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't need a harem. I don't know. Is it harem two, three? How many is a harem? I don't know. Is don't there know. a definition for harem? But, but, I, uh, but I think what but you're that's... saying is, is that, yeah, you're saying that, that you want to be polyamorous and have multiple partners but you want all of the multiple partners to be exclusive to you. Right. That's in Why an ideal it? world. And I recognize that that's not ethically fair. And my, my ethical values wouldn't allow that to happen. So I would never ask that of anybody. If they were to choose that, great. Super duper. Wow. Love it. But if they don't choose that, also great. Um, also. How do you? How do you, sorry, how do you manage the inherent paradox in that? Paradox? What's the inherent paradox? 
you know, I mean, you're, you want to have, you want to have your cake and you want to eat it too, essentially. You want to have all of these partners that are monogamous to you and then not expect, but hope, right? Hope would be a fair word to use. Hope sure. that they would be monogamous to you. How do you manage I think I think hope is even not the word. I think what I, in the, in the choosing of my partners thus far, what I've looked for is alignment and therefore uh, the alignment might be, you know, 80% and then that 20% is they're, they're polyamorous. They're not going to be monogamous, right? That's mm -hmm. fine. As long as I'm in the 80% range of alignment, I'm happy, right? And, and asking that of somebody isn't something that I would ever do. I know that that's wrong, right? But if I mm -hmm. were to find someone who was in alignment with that and said, I'm monogamous to you. I don't need any other partners. Cool. Cool beans. I'm happy. You know what I mean? Then that's, mm -hmm. that's a bonus. That would be like a nice thing. Mm -hmm. Now that, what does that do for the monogamous side of me? Well, the monogamous side of me is very easily threatened by other partners that they might have. Right. Mm -hmm. So that alleviates and mitigates some of that stress on my system because my monogamous side of me is in play, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's not something that I've issued or, or, or shut down or worked through or, or released. Um, it's very much still part of me, right? But rather than being Obviously. mad at that part of me, I accept that part of me and say, you know, like I placated and say, it's okay. You know, we'll be safe in these other ways. And we're 80% aligned with this person. And, and that's great. Um, I've also been monogamous to poly partners, right? Like when we opened up, you were dating and I was monogamous to you. And I didn't mind that state of affairs either, right? I was threatened by other partners though. And so my job as an ambi amorous person, as, as I see it, is always to manage my emotions just like everyone else. Um, I think it's maybe a little more challenging because, because I'm not, I'm not working to become something I'm not. I'm not trying to suppress or, or repress those feelings of, mono-mindedness while I'm in a poly relationship I work with them and I and I I thank them for showing up and I kind of expect them to come to the party you know what I mean and mm -hmm. when they do I'm not surprised I'm not hurt I'm not devastated I'm not mad at myself I manage them and I think rather effectively given the tools that you know we've amassed over the years huh? Yeah. I'm doing pretty well. I don't know. Yeah. Checking yeah, in. I think so. Okay. Yeah, I think you're doing great. Yeah. I think you're doing Thanks. great. So is poly a choice for you then? No, I used to say that it was. But I think in reflection over the years, I recognized how active a part of my life it's been. I literally have toggled polyamory monogamy polyamory enm polyamory monogamy polyamory monogamy polyamory that's my relationship history <laughs> you know um if i were to add it all up i think it would be pretty equal in terms of how much time i i spend mentally and emotionally in both places whether it's physical mm -hmm. or not, whether I'm actually engaged in the dynamic or not, years mm -hmm. within a monogamous marriage, um, desiring other connections, you know, uh, even trying to facilitate other connections or having other connections mm -hmm. unethically <laughs> through cheating, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I feel like I have come now to a place of understanding where it is part of me it, just as much as the the mono part of me i'm not mad at that part of me either i'm not trying to shut it down or repress it and become monogamous you know what i mean mm -hmm. i'm trying to really meet myself as authentically as i can as a 
full human being with all mm -hmm. of me present. And I know that other people experience this differently. Some people experience it as sort of parts, right? If you've done any work with internal family systems or, you know, they talk about the parts. So this would be similar in that there's that mono part and that poly part, um, and they take up different kinds of space within, and they might not take up a lot of space until triggered, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, cruising along at a polyamorous state, feeling very secure, feeling very healthy and happy, and 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 then suddenly that mono part is triggered by an event, and it rises up more fully right and i think we all have that because of mononormative programming right so it's hard to avoid those those feelings coming up but if you're ambiamorous it's almost like a you know it's almost like that the scales really shift right and it's like yeah. one so side when, is when it yeah. So when the scales shift, then do you want to go, do you then want to be monogamous? Yeah, the draw can be really powerful. Sure. Yeah. Just like mm -hmm. it was when I was monogamous and I wanted other partners. Right. 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 Yeah. Okay. Cool. So what does being ambiamorous do for you in terms of how you relate and connect with others? What does it do for me? I'm not sure it does anything particularly for me other than well, let me ask it maybe way. understanding it... i have clarity and understanding about both parts of 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 the relationship dynamic spectrum okay so when i'm working with clients for example i do a lot of work with uh poly mono couples because mm -hmm. they feel heard and seen both of them right they know that i get it if they are monogamous that I relate to them still. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's an advantage, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like you're not you're not trying to convince them to become poly. No. Because you no, and I think the work that yeah, I think the work that you and I both do is really about authenticity, isn't it? One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. We're not trying to convince anybody to do anything. Right. Just trying and to figure so, out what works best for them. So. So you, exactly. so this is almost like a superpower in some ways for you because it enables you enables you to understand both sides of the coin, maybe more so than than somebody yeah. who's just in Polyland, right? Yeah, I like that. It's a superpower. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. So we were talking a bit about this yesterday, and mm -hmm. something came up as we were discussing it. Um, it's not it's not off topic, but it might seem to be off topic. But Can I preface I... this with what I was, what I introduced yesterday, and then you came up with your kind of For nugget sure. of wisdom? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that, but yeah, okay, sure. I thought it was terrific. So, um, what we were it was talking about self-deprecating today, apparently. Oh, that's okay. I need a hug. You need a hug? Yeah. No, no, <laughs> not right this second. Hey. Don't don't That's ask fine. for it unless you mean it. Because I'm gonna come over there. The people and listening you. will just the people <laughs> listening will just hear dead silence and it'll be boring. Anyway. Okay. So okay. I was talking about my mono mindset belief system. How I often talk about the soup and salad uh comparison. So I love soup, I love salad. I don't want my life without either one of them. They're completely different. I'm not upset with the soup that it's not cold and crisp. And I'm not upset with the salad that it's not warm and chunky. Right. Okay. Right. <laughs> I We're appreciate about soup, right? Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. I appreciate both types of food and I want that variety. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a way for my mono mind to wrap itself around the logic of poly, to understand mm. why I would want more than one partner. Also, I mean, another piece of that puzzle could be that there's needs that aren't being fulfilled, right? So it's another justification, if you will. Why do I need a, another partner? Well, because 
this partner doesn't like to go swimming and I love swimming. So I need a partner that loves to go swimming as an example. It's kind of a lame example, but it's also safe. So <laughs> you know what oh, I mean? Our, and audience, so, our audience doesn't expect safe from us. I don't think. Oh, I know. I'm just, I'm trying, I'm trying to be like a little PC so that it's not like triggering to us, you and me. Awesome. Um, what? <laughs> Fuck that. You want me to trigger you? Oh no, honey. No, don't trigger me. I know what you no, mean. No. I get it. I get it. I get it. There are certain needs that no. you need that you would like to have fulfilled by other people or certain needs that you would like to have fulfilled. And you recognize that there are things that I as a partner would or would not do. And so therefore you, you seek that out in other people. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. Now right. we've talked a little bit at length about that, about how we shouldn't just go out into the world and sort of check boxes and look for this, that, mm -hmm. or the other quality. But that is part of, I think, how my mono mind manages to understand polyamory. I get it. I can see it. I, it's a need not being fulfilled. It makes sense that you would want to fulfill it. Or it's a variety that you would like to enjoy. I get it, right? Mm -hmm. On the flip side of that, there's on the far side of the spectrum, the poly belief system, which is you know, I can have as many relationships with as many different people as I want to, and I don't need a reason. That's right. Harder for me to go there because I'm not fully poly, but a lot of very, you know, uh, strong-minded poly people, that's where their belief systems lay. And I have difficulty relating to that because my mono side is still very well developed. And so for me, those other sort of justifications help me mm -hmm. and they might help other people. I don't think there's anything wrong with understanding the need for, uh, you know, enjoying things that you want in your life or having things that you mm -hmm. want in your life. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So then you came up with your lovely wisdom. Well, when you were explaining all of this to me, and it, again, it still comes up, um, we, it's interesting that we need a reason to be poly, whereas with mono doesn't require any justification because it's the societal default, right? It's, yeah. it's the expected norm, right? So we don't need reasons to be mon monogamous. We don't sit around talking, oh, why are you monogamous? You know, <laughs> well, what makes you monogamous, right? We don't have those conversations. Well, I shouldn't say we don't, but it's, it's, it's quite probably quite rare that people will question their monogamy um uh at all we'll question somebody question somebody else's monogamy right um okay. you know oh really so you're monogamous why is that you know you don't hear that no. but as soon as you say you're polyamorous or non-monogamous it's like oh okay well that's just an excuse to cheat or you know you just don't mm -hmm. know what you want or you don't love your your partner the right way you know there's mm -hmm. a host of other things and so then we have to justify it or we feel we have to justify it we don't but we, we, I, I feel that urge to want to justify it. But I think what I'm starting to realize is, is that there, I, I don't know that I want to justify it anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, just like with you with MBM, right? You, you don't, you're not interested in justifying it, right? Not you, really. You're, we're, <laughs> we're doing this podcast today because we're trying to explain it and what it means to you in the hopes that other people in the world who might be struggling with finding a label that would suit them might think, oh, wow, okay, this label suits me. And the thing with labels to keep in mind too is is that it could suit you today but not tomorrow yeah absolutely right? you could you could realize tomorrow holy shit i'm actually polyamorous and not ambiamorous i'm you know and that's great or you could realize tomorrow oh shit i'm actually you know whatever right it doesn't matter you don't want to think... say it <laughs> i can realize tomorrow that i'm monogamous um yeah. and that's sort of your biggest fear it's, it? it's it certainly is one of them yes it certainly is one of them though i know that you wouldn't expect me to to be different no. just because of your monogamy so but it still brings up a whole host of activated shit um but yeah so yeah. I, so i think i think that's the interesting thing about the label and i, I think that's why we wanted to have the podcast about ambi Henry today is because you know if you're out there looking for something and you haven't landed on a label if you feel the need for a label or whatever, and this one suits you and it 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 sort of resonates with you in some way, then feel free to snag onto it and use it for as long as it serves you. 
Yeah, yeah. Cool. And also, I am a big believer in, like I said earlier, knowing ourselves authentically and not trying to be something we're not or beating ourselves up because we're not a certain way. And meaning, right. meaning that that in in the poly community, and I'm not saying this is true with all everybody, but there are there there is this, there can be this narrative that says that that if you're not striving to be completely rid of all mononormative programming, then you're not doing it right, right? Because right. that's the goal is to be completely polyamorous and not have a monogamous bone in your body, right? 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 That's the that's the ladder of success. That's one of the that's one of the litmus tests of success in, in polyamory. Now, I'm not saying that's the way everybody feels. That's not at all what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, is that I've seen it and I've heard it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's misleading because well, that's not the way. Okay, not only that, but we're talking about a lifetime usually of mononormative programming from a very young start when we're we're talking about, you know, fairy tales and even, you know, um, the hetero stories that were exposed, like the whole idea of like sort of mononormative and gender norms and, and sexual norms and all of that stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. um, unraveling that mm -hmm. can be another whole lifelong journey that you might not complete in this life. And that's okay. What is important, I think, is to recognize what do you want to need in your world? How do you want to be in the world? Where are you? Where are you most comfortable? Um, where are you most authentic? And and leaning into that. And that sometimes means accepting that there's programming that hasn't been unraveled and undone. And then you manage it. You work mm -hmm. with it. You 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 know, you learn the tools that, that are effective for you. And, you know, for me, a lot of that is um, really taking the time to reflect and articulate myself. I process verbally. So this is really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, our conversations that we have all the time, which is a huge cornerstone of our relationship and very helpful to me. Um, I need to talk about things in order to understand what do I feel? What do I need? What do I want? Really? And like you said, it'll change, it'll morph and that's okay. And sometimes it won't morph, right? That's okay too. Just like when I, when I talk with clients about like big traumatic wounds that they might have that they're carrying with them. Our job is not to necessarily heal the wound through our sessions. Our job is to, to keep the wound from infecting you, mm -hmm. right? And negatively impacting your capacity, your function, your what you want to need and, and how you want to be in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the so wound much, may still so much, exist all your life. <laughs> right, right. There's so much talk in the world about... I want to be completely healed and Ugh. I'm on a healing journey. That's great. That's fantastic. But just understand that that also means that some of those wounds will never be fully healed. And yeah. You and have I think to learn how to manage that. It is a journey, right? It's a journey and we may not see the end of it in this life and that's okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, people say I had a, a traumatic relationship. I should heal before I get into another one. Well, good luck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, with that. I don't know. Well. It didn't work out for me, but we do heal through our relationships, through yeah. having healthy conversations, authentic ones, vulnerability, right? You've taught me a lot about vulnerability. That's part of why I can say these things out loud. It's because you came into my world and shook it up and went, Hey, <laughs> Let's talk vulnerably about ourselves. And I was like, oh, me, okay. I don't really want to. I will deflect with humor, you know, and I will, I will make you giggle and laugh instead of like talking about the real things. But because you 
have been in my world now for many years, I get to say this. I get to come on this podcast and share my truth mm-hmm. and what I'm even even if it's hard and it is hard to talk about because part of me is worried about perception and judgment and you know people saying well she's not really poly then and you know that kind of stuff um what would you say to that's somebody fine. Like that? what would you say to somebody who said you're not really poly then i'd say that's your perception of things i know what it's like inside my brain and in this body and uh, through my experiences i've really come to accept that i identify as both it's almost i mean it's almost like bisexuality right uh, if you're in a if you're a bisexual in a relationship with somebody who has the same gender as you you present straight or, or you present gay people assume that you're gay they don't know that you're bi unless you tell them and you might not feel safe telling them so in some cases. You might feel like you might get judged, right? Or the other way around. If you're in a relationship with somebody who is opposite gender, you appear straight for all intents and purposes, right? Straight passing, and then you, you don't want to necessarily come out as as being bi. Same thing here with ambiamory. It can feel very vulnerable to say, half of me is mono or maybe maybe it's not half maybe it's 40 percent. maybe it's a third like you know for different people it'll be different feelings and it might shift and morph over time too right Mm -hmm. sometimes i feel very poly i'm like super poly and then like 10 percent of me is is like having a little mono conversation in the corner right Mm -hmm. other times it's like dead on 50 50 and i'm like oh boy okay oh, that sucks i mean okay. it does suck it <laughs> does suck. <laughs> sorry it does i'm not being judgy much no um, you're yeah, right so, but for me it's a struggle it does, it's, i can imagine yeah. i can imagine it would be challenging to be in that headspace i mean i have some semblance of that because i'm still trying to uh deprogram from a lot of more mononormative default stuff and even mm-hmm. even even though i've been doing this for well well over 16 years now um it still comes up. There are still areas where mm-hmm. I'm like, oh shit, that's interesting. Okay, let's take a look at that, right? Um, and yeah. it's it's oftentimes it's that mono programming of of that that insidiousness of the mono programming, right? So, you know, I uh, as far as my take on Ambi Emery, I say if it works for you, go for it. Like, you know, it's it's just like anything else in the world. The label's only as good as it's it, it it's only as good as it can serve you right mm-hmm. so if it's serving you then use it that's great mm-hmm. and you know fine. speaking to that if you're in a relationship with somebody who identifies as ambiamorous that might be a way of relating to them right your own experiences with struggling through the mononormative programming mm-hmm. those little the things that come up for you that are like you know true love means exclusivity or you know, <laughs> uh, whatever, whatever it is, or I need to be mm-hmm. married and with or someone going to leave me because life. I'm doing this with them and not, or doing that with, with somebody else and not with them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So in order to relate to your partner, you know, that's maybe a place to kind of start and say, mm-hmm. I, I kind of know what that must feel like. Right. Yeah. It's just, I think more pronounced maybe for the ambiamorous person. Right. And maybe not always just in certain cases, like uh, my conversations with other ambiamorous folks have ranged from, you know, I feel like 50, 50 is definitely the case here or like I am 90% one or the other, or I'm somewhere in the middle or there are parts that just show up, you know, like suddenly out of the blue um, in my mon- monogamous relationship that I'm experiencing right now and that I've chosen, I'll have a lot of poly thoughts and I'll, I'll you know, want to move into that headspace and those kinds of relationships, right? And then I have to manage that. Um, so, yeah, I think there's probably a lot of people that are ambiamorous that just don't know the term, don't understand it. 
never, you know, never experienced someone explaining it to you, to them. So hopefully this will help. Yeah, I think so. I think you've done a great job of explaining it and your experiences with it. So <laughs> I think so. Was it, was there anything else that you wanted to add? Anything else that you wanted to talk about that I didn't ask about? Just don't shame someone for the labels that they choose that they resonate with. Um, even if you're not a labeled person and you don't like them or need them, recognize their their purpose and their usefulness to creating a sense of community, belonging, identity for someone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably a fear of yours is that in sharing this, that you're going to feel like you're, you're going to, you're going to experience some shame. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I've had those conversations. In fact, I've had people say pretty, pretty negative things <laughs> directly to mm -hmm. me. Um, like that's just made up. That's not real. <laughs> you know, that kind of it's thing. It's all made up. It's all not real. I mean, come on, really? It's all a fucking construct. Well, it's really? all a construct, but the thing is, is the feelings are real. The experiences right. are real. We're identifying, right. we're categorizing. And that's what we do as humans to make sense of the world. Most of us right. is, you know, uh, we say those four legged animals share these characteristics and we're going to call them cats, you know, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. so in the same way, uh, labels in relationship dynamics serve people. And if it doesn't serve you, great. But don't yuck on someone else's yum, you know? That's <laughs> what they that need thing. and that's what they are enjoying uh, or right. helps them at the end of the day. Great. It's all about it, empowerment, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yuck on somebody else's yum. I love that saying. Okay, yeah. cool. All right. Okay. Well, um, this has been wonderful. I've learned a lot. Uh, I mean even though I knew most of this, I've learned a lot. So um and those those of you listening or watching i hope that uh there's been something in here that's resonated with you and you, you know some gem of wisdom or information or insight into your own experiences and your own journey whether you're ambiamorous whether you know somebody who is whether you never understood it whether it's something that is still quite alien to you whatever that wherever you're at with this um mm -hmm. maybe you've found some little nugget of information that will help you in your journey and remember, choose love and keep it kind. We'd love to hear your comments, questions, or topic suggestions. And don't forget to subscribe. And you're invited to join our Facebook group, Empowered Poly Relationship Support and Advice. You can reach out to us on our websites at gregmillion.com and at leannemillion.com or follow us on Instagram at thegregmillion and at leannemillion.com.